Hey everyone, it's Mike from Chess Lifestyle, and if you're following my Twitter, you'll have seen the recent drama, you could say, between me and uh, Sir Ramesh, uh, greatest chess coach from India, uh, who coached uh, Pragananda. And in short, what ended up happening was I bought uh, Ramesh's calculation book. I am very dedicated to improving my chess right now, and I was working on an exercise which I personally felt was too difficult for the level category it was set at. And the comments that were included in this calculation exercise to me were really unhelpful. And I basically called out Ramesh on Twitter and Ramesh replied. And then there was a whole like long back and forth. Well, it was more like just Ramesh posting like tweet after tweet about the situation, kind of missing my point entirely. And it even got to the point where even Emil Satovsky, director of FIDE, chimed in his opinion, which we always love to see Emil's opinion, right? So anyway, um, the point is that it definitely escalated, definitely blew up. And I wanted to share with you guys, like, the puzzle itself and why, you know, a lot of the arguments from the other side don't really make sense given the context of this puzzle. So this is the position in front of you right now. It is white's turn to move and white to play and find the best move. So if you haven't already seen the answer or you haven't given it a proper think, please spend five to eight minutes, this is Ramesh's words, not mine, to find the forced winning continuation for white. Okay, go. So, uh, given that you've spent some time uh, studying this, um, I would like to now show you the variations. So the thing is, in this position, it's not so simple what the right move may be. And one idea that may come to mind is actually we can take this pawn. Because after queen takes pawn, we've got the move bishop takes e5. And a very nice uh, thing we can spot is that if the queen takes, the queen is actually loose and we've got a nice discovered check, knight g6 picking up the queen. So for anyone who didn't see that, I'll just play it out just to make that extra, extra clear that we're going to take the queen next move. So that sounds all well and great. Now, when I was calculating this puzzle, I also found this and almost, I just dismissed this. Uh, I'm not dismissed this. I almost felt that this was the answer. I was like, okay, it's a 1600 puzzle, you know, I got this, no problem. But I was like, okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's just make sure that this is working. And then I look, rook takes d6, queen takes d6, bishop takes e5, does, does black have any other moves? The point being, there's a really sneaky plan for black, which is that after queen c5 check, if white just plays king f1, which seemingly doesn't change the position, black actually has the move queen takes e5 now, because now on knight g6, black can play the surprising f takes g6 with a check, and now you're not picking up the queen. So because of this, so after rook takes d6, queen takes d6, bishop takes e5, queen c5 check, that means white needs to play the move d4, in which after queen c1 check, king f2, now you have to try and evaluate this position. And to be honest, to me, it still looks like we have a lot of attacking promise. I mean, the bishop and the queen are lined up threatening mate in one. And with careful calculation, you will notice that black has the only move, f6, to defend. And on f6, the story is not even over there. Because at this point, you can still continue to complicate the position with the move knight e6, threatening mate. And black cannot take the bishop because of mate in one. So black needs to play a move like rook f7. In which a move like bishop takes f6 looks very promising because we're threatening queen b8 after gf6, which would be a mate. But in fact, actually, no, the rook takes f6 with check. And because the rook takes f6 with check, you don't have time for queen takes g7 mate. So because of this f6 move, this whole attacking plan does not work for white. So that means we can dismiss rook takes d6. So that's the very first thing. Rook takes d6 is not working because of like five moves down the line f6 and then a very careful defense from black prevents white's attack. So we go back to the drawing board and we start looking at different ideas and you may find the correct solution which is bishop takes e5, pawn takes and knight e6 which as a tactic looks really great because the pawn can't take because the rook is hanging at the end and it's a fork, right? 
But still, in this position, I, you know, I kept looking, I found this idea, bishop takes e5, pawn takes knight e6. And at this point, I was concentrated enough, I was putting in the effort to keep looking for resources. And at this point after knight e6, there's queen a7 check. Um, note that queen b6 check is not working because basically there are some lines where um, the queen needs to be keeping tabs on this f7 pawn. So on bishop takes e5, pawn takes e5, knight e6, queen a7 check. The real meat of this position, why I had a real problem with the comments afterwards, is that in this position, I even saw that the most natural move king h1, because you want, you want to keep the queens on the board, is met by rook g8. And Ramesh mentions this in the analysis, and this is holdable by black. And I saw this position, and I thought this was holdable for black, and I kept looking, and I found that in this position, actually, there is this move, um, sorry, knight e6, queen a7, queen f2. And I was trying to make this work. Um, and after queen f2, the thing is that black has some options. Now, the most obvious option to me is that given that we're looking for a forced win for white, so literally the task is to find the forced winning continuation for white, it doesn't make too much sense to trade queens. But I looked into it anyway, because maybe we have like a winning resulting position. So in this position, after queen f2, uh, after queen takes f2, rook takes f2, the point is that the pawn is still pinned, so it can't take the knight because the rook would hang at the end with mate. So in this position, we take back. And now black almost is lost, because if black just moves the rook, then we just take on f7, and we have a great position, a rook on the 7th, I believe a pawn up. So the point is that black needs to play rook e8, in which, at this moment, the knight is attacked. So we can't, well, the thing is, we can take on f7, it looks like, because there's no rook takes e6 because of rook f8 mate. But at this moment, after we take on f, uh, f7, the thing is, black is the incredible move king g8. Um, and okay, I don't know if you guys can visualize this even. Like, okay, this, I don't know what level you guys are watching this, but I can play this out if this makes it easier. So the point is, that on bishop takes e5, we've got this fork, queen a7, queen f2, if he trades the queen, there's the incredible move rook, e, rook e8, gaining the tempo on the knight, and the point is rook f7, the story is not over, because this is not the end, because of king g8. And now it's a double attack, and now a move like rook takes g7, king h8, doesn't work, because you can't just go back because you're losing the knight, and it's a double attack. Like, the thing is, there's no more mate, because there's now king g7. So you have to visualize all of this, okay? Now, the other thing is that in this position, um, you then need to spot that the best move is knight g5. Not rook takes g7 is the correct move in this position. In which, what Ramesh gives in his analysis, is that after knight g5, black plays h6, and we play rook c7 win. Because the point is that even though we have this double attack, we gain a tempo on the bishop, and therefore we have um, a winning rook engine. So not so simple to see, right? But in fact, Ramesh's analysis is not even completely accurate because after knight g5, black actually has the stunning move b5. And I'm going to give this a double x clam because this is a pawn sacrifice. And the point is, it's very subtle because after pawn takes, now we play h6. And the point is after rook c7, we've actually got bishop b5. And the point is that even though we've sacrificed the pawn, these pawns are completely dead. We're attacking the backwards d d3 pawn, and the rook is, you know, gaining activity. And look, I didn't see b4 in my calculations. I saw queen f2, queen takes f2, rook takes f2. There is no attack. And okay, sure, maybe I could have looked further to see that, like, after rook e8, rook takes f7, king g8, I have this fantastic move, knight g5. But the point is that this position isn't even winning after this spectacular move b4. So honestly, this whole position, like, you know, find the force winning continuation for white, it's not even correct. And if you don't believe me, check the engine. In this position, Ramesh gives h6, the, the move is b4. And the bishop gets a beautiful square on b5. So it's not a simple calculation. It's really not. So the point is from the beginning, after bishop takes e5, d takes e5, knight e6, queen a7 check, queen f2, Ramesh's main line is to not take the queen, but to play the move queen e7. And I think from a calculation perspective, 
in this position, when you look at queen f2 and you calculate queen takes f2 and you realize that the position is very unclear, right? To actually have like the thought that actually, hold up, we shouldn't take the queen um, because that's winning for white, even though it's not even winning for white. But let's even assume that it's winning for white. To then keep looking at this line, given that you don't even know if bishop takes e5, knight e6 is the correct move. Because, okay, this looked promising, but then so does rook takes d6. This also looks promising, right? So you don't really know, and there are other moves to be considered in this starting position as well, but you don't know what's right, right? So how do you know to keep looking in this position for a move like queen e7? And after queen e7, to then look further and see that the only move for white to keep some kind of advantage is knight takes g7. Now, at this moment, I think that after knight takes g7, it would be fair enough to write this off as a good, good position for white, right? Queen e7, knight takes g7. But apparently, after knight takes g7, we should also be finding this crazy move, bishop takes e4, a, a, a peace sacrifice in the middle of the board because I guess the bishop is hanging, sure. d takes e4, now king takes g7, and now rook takes a6. And what Ramesh says is, ideally, we should come until this point while analysing the initial position, as most, if not all, the moves were forcing moves. Well, for starters, this queen f2, queen e7 is not a forced move at all. Queen takes f2 is a very legitimate candidate, and a very deep one at that, with this extra b4 resource that Ramesh didn't even include in his analysis. And there are so many factors to consider, for a 1600 to 2000 puzzle with 5 to 8 minutes with the prompt to find a forcing like win, a forced win for white, given that this is the actual final position, so the final position is rook takes a6, which is a pawn up endgame with a queen and rook against queen and rook. Now, okay, this is a winning position for white, I guess, with best play. I, I wouldn't call it winning, I'd say it's like strong advantage, right? And sure, let's just pretend for a second that b4 didn't exist and this h6 move was in fact winning for white. Now, this whole example is deep. It's hard. I put in the effort. I got to queen f2. I saw that um, queen takes f2 was complicated. I, I saw these lines, but I didn't go as deep as required. But I gave it a bloody good effort, right? And the conclusion is... Only by finding all the important moves for both sides and getting the whole solution correctly can we make real progress in our analytical skills. Missing these critical moves is a sign that either our effort is lacking or our concentration is not good enough. Try harder in the next position when such misses happen. Now to me, that whole paragraph is purely negative. That whole paragraph is saying like, you know, no matter what you saw, Unless you see everything, you're not making real progress. So, you know, pull your socks up, do a better job, right? It's very different than saying only by, you know, finding all the important moves is not easy. But if you can see all the moves, then you can make real progress. Like, if you phrase it in that way, maybe it can be better. Or for instance, saying like, you know, missing these critical moves is a sign that either our effort is lacking or our concentration is not good enough. Like, no, like those two reasons are not the only reasons why you can mess up this position. You can mess up this position because you have problems with visualization. You can mess up this position because problems with evaluation. It's not only a case of effort, lack of effort or lack of concentration. So maybe if the phrasing was missing these critical moves can be a sign that either our effort is lacking or our concentration is not good enough, fine. But the way it's written, it's so accusing and so assuming that the mistake that White is making in this position when trying to solve this position is that our concentration and effort is not good enough. Now, I think it is completely fair to criticize this, that when you are trying to work on a calculation book, and trust me, it is difficult to work on calculation as a chess player. It's literally probably the best reason for a training partner because calculation work on your own is so difficult and so difficult to keep pushing yourself despite not having a tournament situation, like, like an actual competitive match situation, to really get all the way to the bottom of this exercise is bloody hard. 
And if you are just writing a conclusion that is very dismissive, very belittling, you know, this is not, this is not ideal for a calculation book. Now, I made this comment on Twitter, not expecting it to be that big of a deal, basically just to, you know, like, hopefully have Ramesh say, you know, hey, look, like, I'm sorry for it being so harsh, didn't mean it to be, um, because, you know, Ramesh is a great guy. Like, okay, let me just get this straight. Ramesh is a successful coach, no questions. Ramesh is also a great coach, also no questions. Like, seeing his, like, character, seeing, like, you know, the achievements he's done in his life as a coach, these are not debates. But is Ramesh a perfect coach? No. And no coach is perfect. Every coach and every, every person should be willing to accept constructive criticism to improve as, you know, whatever profession they're doing. And I think, as you can see from this example, this is not a perfect example. As you can see, there are resources like before that Ramesh missed, right? There are the fact that uh, Ramesh is saying find the force winning continuation when the final position is simply a pawn up, pawn up endgame, right? There are the fact that the position is set for 1600 to 2000 level when clearly you see that resources like B4 to see it six moves deep into the variation is not 1600 to 2000. Don't like, don't even, don't even like, like at me at like, oh, you know, you know, 1600 Indian kids can find B4 and this is just a cultural difference, yada, yada, yada. Like, no, no, just no. So that is the point, right? So I ramble on for a couple more minutes, but you guys get the point. Basically, Ramesh, if you're watching this, I'd really appreciate a comment about the analysis that I just gave. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go off to do some more calculation, actually more calculation on your book as well. <laughs> so um, I'm going to focus more on the chess than making analysis videos like these. But uh, yeah, if any of you are new to chess lifestyle, I hope you can uh, have, a have a look at the other content that I post on this channel. Um, there's a lot to gain, I really think so. And I hope you have a great chess day. So see you guys in the next video.